Eli and Marcel himself, he, he's probably one of Vancouver's foremost uh, online program managers. Um, and he mentions that part, I don't know why. But uh, the Suzuki Foundation is a pretty well respected organization, and they've got a, a, an awesome online program thanks to you. Um, this is all really formal, and I can't even see you guys. Um, which is fine. No, 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 it's, it's fine. I'll get used to it. So this is a bit of an experiment for me to talk about network organizations. Uh, when I was talking to Eli about this topic and, and um, you know, what would be useful for this particular group, um, uh, this is kind of what we came to is, is you know, there's, there's not many, this is, you know, my business really struggled for many, many years here. We're, we're Kinecopia is, is almost 19 years old this summer always been doing websites for social change and, and we had to be really small for a long time because it's a really small ecology here. Um, there's there's not that many uh, nonprofits or institutions. Certainly back then I wasn't drawn to working with any big institution really. I was my heart was really with the smaller groups. Um, to make my business work I've had to mostly work outside of this this city, um, in the East Coast and, and other places, mostly US and Europe. But um, we were thinking, you know, what is it that a lot of the people are involved here with is these kind of small organizations that are nimble, they're light on their feet. Um, uh, whether they're a business or a nonprofit, you know, there's not a lot of funders here. There's not a lot of um, corporate donors, so so we're kind of making a little go a long way. We've, you know, Adbusters came from here, um, Greenpeace started here, and these are sort of the, the, the lore of our land. And um, so this topic, it's it's a little bit controversial in other places. I'm going to do this. I've made this presentation a little bit nerdo because um, I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this topic, and, and it's something I'm kind of positioning my business around, and I'm trying to get more big lumbering nonprofits to think more like network organizations. So bear with some of the theory I have in here. I'll try to kind of go through that fast. Uh, I use this as an opportunity to create something that I'm hopefully going to do uh, um, quite a bit in other places. Um, so just so I can get a sense of who's in the room, I mean, how many of y'all work, uh, well, how many of y'all work full time in some kind of social change, however you define it? Yeah, I can. <laughs> OK, that's cool. I can really get my. Um, no, so how many of you work for like a, a nonprofit of more than say 15 staff? Can I hear some of the names? Just show up. Suzuki Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian Cancer Society. Canadian Cancer Society. Canadian Cancer Society. Canadian Way. Union Gospel Mission. Mission. Union Way. Easter Seals. Okay, so you guys are gonna hate me by the end of this, but um, don't take it personally. I actually, uh, I mean, I'm kidding a little bit. Um, I really love NGOs. I was in a meeting with an NGO from Ottawa on Monday, and I was just like, just. I'm just I just love people that are trying to make the world better, and and yet at the same time we're just so frustrated with the institutions and the and the, the dysfunctional structures that happen in a lot of them. So for some of you who don't work in NGOs, some of this stuff will be like, hey, um, or if you haven't worked in a bigger institution. Um, so how many of you would you say work in in a I don't know a small NGO or maybe like a network nonprofit? And what are some names? Smart change. Smart change. Okay. Growing chefs. Sorry. Growing chefs. Okay. Oh, yeah. What was that one? Growing chefs. Growing chefs. Um, well, so I'm going to talk tonight about like both those things. I mean, we kind of set you up in the, in the description of what I'm going to talk about, um, and I hope that it's helpful. You know, my, my story, I kind of told you it was that um, to make my business work, I had to go and work for some of the larger organizations, and I really do enjoy working for, um, we just uh, started to work with Human Rights Watch in New York last week, which is an amazing organization with you know researchers in 90 countries. And, they're in the New York Times twice today and pretty much every day. Um, you know, that's really exciting to work for them. Please don't die. Um, and yet my heart is actually with the smaller nonprofits. You know, I, Gregor Robertson is an old friend and Happy Planet and Joel Solomon, the Renewal World. Um, uh, that's where I, that's where my bread and butter came from. A lot of groups that no one's ever heard of. Um, a lot of groups that are like Ashoka Fellows. It's a, it's a foundation that tends to fund more kind of network-driven uh, social entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm really excited about this topic. Um, you know, you've never heard of most of these groups because they're not really well known. They don't really make it their business to tell you what their brand is and to fundraise kind of small dollar donations. And those are the charities we tend to know about are the ones that are really kind of fundraising um, driven. But I think actually network organizations are one of the most exciting things happening in the social change sector. Um, I think they're actually a higher level of evolution than uh, a traditional than an NGO structure than an indep independent institutional structure. That doesn't mean that they're better and that they're the only model that should work, but I think that we actually really need more of them. Um, uh, we have a lot of nonprofits, and I think we'll need a lot more networks and, and connective tissue between them all. Um, so, 
I think that's enough of an intro. So again, I, I, I'll warn you, my, my PowerPoint should be like interesting, and then it'll get kind of uh, nerdo, and then I'm gonna tell some stories, and then uh, better yet, um, Riley from Open Media, which is an amazing local nonprofit, uh, network nonprofit, we call them that, is gonna come up and tell their story, and then Joe, of course, telling some of the Keystone Excel stuff from 350. Um, so this is just my spiel so that you listen to me. Um, uh, We've been doing this for a long time. We decided to focus on strategy because that's where I found the most opportunity for change. And, and ultimately what I found is uh, it's actual institutional limitations that are limiting a lot of the cool digital stuff that we want to do. And that's around sort of teams and, and, um, and how organizations are set up, which you'll hear me say, talk about. And then some clients we've worked with, really big nonprofits, um, uh, some really cool ones like Net Impact, which, which works with business schools around the world. We, we did the Digital Vision for the City. Their, their new website is going to launch fairly soon. Uh, everyone in town has to work for PCI Hydro at some point. Um, so, uh, so let's let's let's. Uh, this is a presentation I kind of gave to executives a lot, and, and um, to try to get them to think in new ways. I don't really have to say this anymore. It's pretty obvious that there's a lot of change happening right now, and people that are comfortable with change are are going to do really well in these times. So, why is that happening? Let's just really briefly fly through. You, you're a crowd that kind of knows all this stuff. It's in your bones. Um, you know, this is not kind of new for you, but but for a lot of people that work in institutions, this is still kind of scary stuff that's causing them to rethink how a lot of things are structured. So culturally, you know, audiences are over-marketed too. They feel manipulated. We all figured out the rules of persuasion marketing a long time ago, and we're using them incessantly to constantly tell people something that we want them to hear. Uh, and as Seth Godin calls it, we do that by interrupting and shouting at them. And that's generally how we try to get our messages across. So it's just, it's a hard time to be an audience. People don't really believe institutions are there to help them anymore. That's certainly how I grew up, not really trusting any institutions. Um, I mean, it's very amazing to see when you get a hold of something like a city, what an institution you know, run by amazing people can actually do to make the world better. Um, but you know, whether it's Washingtonitis or the problems of liberal elites or you know, the war on science in, in Ottawa or in, in kind of Republican, a lot of Republican minds, um, you know, that's part of the Tea Party thing. It's kind of the same thing that youth and millennials are just kind of like, eh, I don't really trust that you're really there to, to meet my needs anymore. I don't think you're really responsive. And this relates to nonprofits as well. People aren't interested in single issues anymore. Like, what is homelessness? I, I do a lot of work in homelessness, and homelessness is not just about like finding homes for people, it's about mental health, it's about addictions, it's about opportunities, it's about social justice, uh, it's about geography, it's about so many things mixed in, and so so many institutions are designed around these like single functions and experts who are like we build our expertise in a single field, and that's not really how the world is working anymore. And then at the same time, more and more of us are seeing that we're seeing the interconnections of issues, um, uh, and people want to feel um, people want to get more engaged and feel more more of a connection with their work, which is sort of my next slide. So uh, you know, we're expecting more from our institutions. You know, whether it's working with the city or working with um, you know, BC Hydro got in trouble a couple years ago with a power outage. They didn't do their communications well enough. Their Twitter wasn't really on the ball. Um, they were really kind of engineering oriented. I don't know if some of you guys remember that when the power went out for a week downtown a couple years ago. So a lot of institutions are just struggling to keep up with this 24-7 demand that people want services on their time scale um, in their way. They want authentic voice from institutions. And then as I mentioned before, um, there's this whole trend of engaged volunteerism and people wanting to do more than just serve soup at a kitchen or just give 50 bucks to a charity that they care about. They want to actually be engaged. So, in, you know, out in the world, we've seen this rapid growth of these network organizations, whether it's Avaz, many of you are Avaz members. Um, it's founded by a Canadian pretty amazing group, almost 13 million members now in a three-year-old organization. Uh, People Power is at their core. Uh, Move On has been a huge force in US politics for a long time. There's groups like Charity Water, you know, millions of followers on Twitter, really engaging people in new ways, Kiva. Um, and then some of the climate work we'll talk about tonight, 350. Uh, these guys um, have, you know, they, they, they're very connected, a lot of them, to the youth movement. Um, they're very much, uh, very network driven. And they're really member driven organizations. Some local examples are Beat Now, uh, which works out of my office and, and Open Media. Um, and then at the same time, we have these free agents, uh, the, the shit Harper did people. You know, um, I hang with them. They're like, they're not really part of any NGO. They don't really get paid for this work. They're just throwing stuff out there. That it sticks. Um, you know, an example a couple years ago in Ontario when someone died in a drunk driving incident, a, a Facebook group was organized and within three days Dalton McGinty changed the drunk driving laws. Um, so people like Julian Assange and, and the ultimate kind of free agent, at least a couple year, year ago anyways, was Sarah Palin. At the height of her influence over the US political dialogue, she had a staff of seven. This was a cover story about her staff. 
virtual, you know, total network nonprofit. There's no institution there, yet they're totally driving the agenda. Um, so many of the NGOs on the previous page are kind of like that. So the web, since it started, has really changed online advocacy, which is really where, what my field is. Um, it's, it's spread new models. The internet helps you do fundraising, it helps you do mean spreading, uh, it helps you do uh, grassroots organizing. Um, and you know it's a pretty awesome tool for organizations, but most of them are using it as what we call clicktivism, a sort of recent meme that's, that's come around. Um, and, and it's not just a communications channel. This is part of the challenge of doing this web work for organizations. The web is your whole organization in the world. It's really changed everything. So, like you guys haven't seen these next slides 300,000 times, but you know the internet was publishing first, and now it's conversations. Um, but <laughs> this, you know, this is where a lot of groups are stuck, and it, there's nothing wrong with the traditional web. The traditional web is awesome. It helps you publish in your own channels to your own audiences on your own time. It's amazing. You could grow a list of supporters. You can mobilize them by sending an email to them or trying to say something to them, and you can ask them for help. So you're doing knowledge sharing, you're building a constituency, you're doing real-time organizing, uh, and you're, but you're typically asking for help in simple ways. Now, just so you know, um, it says ask for help. Um, just so you know that uh, you gotta have, you kind of have to master this stuff if you're an organization before you get into the, the groovy stuff. Um, that the web networks, kind of today's uh, I don't know, semantic web, whatever you want to call it, is, is all about, which is you know conversations. It's not just people going to your website; it's going to where they are because actually they're not at your website. Um, it's not all about you; it's enabling self-organizing systems. And in fact, having too much of you in the system really diminishes the ability for self-organizing systems. And it's not just about give me fifty bucks or click on this link; it's actually about meaningful participation, this thing that people really want. So the, these things on the right-hand side are, um, you know, if you look at Facebook, if you look at Groupon, if you look at some of these big business models, this is where they're basing their, you know, this is not just like a nonprofit trend, this is a real, a real general trend. So here's the, here's the rub. Um, most institutions, let's say larger than 15 staff, um, just a total hypothesis, um, but in my experience, lack the ability to really adapt to this new world. They're not taking on the opportunities. They're not able to really capitalize on what's possible. So that's where we all come in with network nonprofits. Um, so how many of y'all know Beth Cantor? Um, if you're in this field, you know you kind of need to follow her. She's she's the she's the guru. She's got um, half a million followers. She's employed by foundations. Um, she's really smart, and she coined this term network nonprofits. So um, I'm not going to read that for you. But a couple of the key points is that they're like kind of permeable. You know, it's easy for people to get in and out. Um, they're all about engagement. Engagement is really at the core of their work. Um, they work very differently. They have less of a focus on um, on kind of delivering their own programs and more on facilitating others to deliver programs or or working with others, convening rather than than necessarily delivering. Um, relationship is is a really important relationship building is a really important aspect. Um, and they're not scared at all about social media. They're not concerned about kind of diving into this world that's causing you know traditional communications people a lot of angst. Less so now than it was a few years ago. So a couple other things that I thought about network nonprofits. Um, this is the boring part, by the way. Um, is uh, so Beth talked about the three attributes of a network nonprofit that they have a social culture that there's a strong degree of transparency and that there's a, a very sim a, a general degree of simplicity. And then you'll see when I contrast them with our traditional NGOs, um, not so much. So um, other attributes that I've noticed is they, they very much smaller budget, they're less reliant on a staff-driven model. Some of them are a direct result of the fact that it's unsustainable generally to have a staff-driven model. Um, they focus on doing one thing really well. Um, I love the fact working in the climate movement a couple years ago, working with groups like Avaz and 350. Like, they're they're you know when I worked with people like Oxfam and, and I shouldn't name too many names, but I worked with like the biggest brands literally on the planet. It was it was really an interesting project, this climate change project. Um, and then I worked with some of these network nonprofits alongside them. And you know these big brands that have 1,800 staff and you know all this like massive firepower, they just couldn't get their shit together to make an internet video. Like, <laughs> kind of get it down on time and then like had any effort to publish it because their poor director of digital is working on 35 other priorities for 35 other people that are pounding their head and pounding their fist on our desk saying, I need this report and you gotta promote this and all this noise and all this chaos and, and ultimately very little capacity to really like jump on things as they happen. You know, it's very rare when our issues actually become relevant in the media and a network organization can kind of like jump on that and like an open media, for example, and grow a 600,000 person list. Um, whereas other groups, it might take them two. Planned Parenthood, it took them 
two or three days to get started at Planned Parenthood. Komen Foundation did a terrible job, and a lot of that is because of um, uh, they're not able to be nimble, too many internal people to run messages by. It's also hard to do this you know, crisis management, let's give them a break. Um, but ultimately, these structures really hold them up. So a lot of people working in network nonprofits are, what I mean by ambidextrous is they're not like, I am policy, I am internet, oh, I am writer. It's the people I've seen working in network nonprofits are these amazing, and you know, a lot of y'all are, 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 I love millennials, and, and, and I think you know, the generation younger than me is gonna rock the world because it's like deep understanding of policy, um, really great understanding of the internet and how it works. Um, and the third one I'm forgetting, I feel like, Rick Perry right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not trying to shut anyone down, so hopefully. Um, so, and they tend to be younger. But wouldn't, wouldn't you just agree that's the case, the, the Joes, and, and, and it's not just because they're not getting paid much, hopefully. Um, but that is a reality of network nonprofits as well. And then there's less of these barriers between like the online and the real world. It's kind of like a, a bullshit barrier anyways that we're all starting to figure out. Um, so, I mean, I'm just gonna keep going, and if you wanna say something, like shout out, I can't actually, I can kinda see your hand. But I, I'm aware that we started a bit late, so I'm gonna like, eh. and does anyone mind? Does anyone, is that okay? Go for it. Yeah, we're all kind of there, like we can go, we can go with it. So, so how are they different? Traditional nonprofits, uh, in my view, over the last number of years working with them, are largely driven by policy. Now, I should say, this isn't true of like a, you know, social service agencies. I don't work with that many social service agencies and I don't really work for the kind of healthcare and disease charities. That's not a field that I'm focused in. I'm more on the kind of social change advocacy side. So just as that granted, I'm looking at a little slice of a, you know, the nonprofit sector is like 12% of the GDP and advocacy is probably a, a half a percent or a fifth of a percent. It's kind of a dumb way to build a business, but it's, it's what I'm driven by. So, so these organizations working in advocacy are, are their, their policy crazy. They, they love to create and promote solutions. Um, they need to find the right answers and they run a lot of long-term campaigns to uh, promote or defend them. And in the States, a lot of it is defense, right? It's really messed up. Um, they have a very expert-based culture. It's all about expertise. Um, and the policy people are driving the ship. You know, in a business, it's usually the sales guys that are like kind of driving the ship. Or maybe if, if you're a tech firm, it's the engineers that are, you know, everyone's the same and we all love our other children, but ultimately it's one that is kind of like gets the most resources, gets the most attention, and a lot of NGOs is the policy people. And then the CEOs are often policy people. Um, they're not necessarily uh, got promoted because they're awesome managers or because they're great communications geniuses. They're often came up through the policy ranks. And then they're usually talking to elite audiences. That's generally who they're trying to reach. Um, and so that's what most of their campaigns are targeted. So the kind of, it's like professionalization, it's control, and it's centralization. So you kind of get where I'm going with this theory that it's hard for them to do the internet, right? Um, particularly on control and centralization. So they're also very siloized and they compete for resources. They've got these really hierarchical top-down cultures. If you're young and if you're new, you're not gonna get listened to. Um, it kind of sucks, but it's true. Uh, it's, it's, very, um, it's very much like kind of how long you've been there is how much you're allowed to have access to decisions and, and power. And, um, a lot of the donor fundraising really drives their, their people work. So, you know, you might get on a list of a nonprofit, but it's kind of run by the fundraising department rather than uh, other departments. And sometimes even run their own parallel programs. One of my clients, you can be on their activist list, and then as soon as you give money, all of a sudden you're on the polar bear list. Because most people give money to polar bears and not to legislative processes. And so, like, it's, there's a really interesting kind of, you end up on all kinds of weird side A's. Um, they're pretty protective and conservative with their brand. They're always trying to promote their own experts. I really saw this in Copenhagen and the climate movement. It was um, people just can't, you know, we had that amount of 10,000 NGO people there, and everyone was there to like, my expert and my answer, and this is WWF's plan, and it's like, you know, we're part of this movement. Like, why are we so focused on our little, uh, our brand? And they act, sign kind of like they're the only people in the world. Um, that was one of the critiques of the Coleman Foundation, is they for, kind of forgot that a lot of their supporters care about breast cancer. They don't really care about the Susan B. Coleman Foundation that's doing something around breast cancer. They join because they care about the movement, not the organization, and people in organizations often forget that. Um, and finally, they're often working in isolation, or these kind of terrible coalitions that are kind of soul-crushing. Um, so what does that mean for nonprofits and online? People are a means to an end. Think about that for a sec. That's really how it's structured. And, and again, I, I love nonprofits, and they, they're, it's a really tough job they have. They're trying to change a really messed up world with really few resources, but this is kind of how they're structured. Online is like list building. Um, 
they do campaigns so they can grow a list, so they can ask for collectivism, and so they can convert you to donors. And, and I'm being a little bit cynical, but not too much. Um, online programs are often made up of email lists that they bought from a big vendor. So you sign some online petition at change.org or care2, and then you're, you're, you're rented and you're bought, and that's how you end up on people's lists. Facebook friends gain via advertising. Um, how many of you get these, the endless crisis uh, cookie cutter actions that tend to always come on a Thursday at 4 p.m., um, no matter whether there's a crisis or not. So that's collectivism. Um, no personalized communication, no ladders of engagement, and no programs, even if we had an engagement ladder to really support engagement. Even if we, one of my clients, we did a survey to find out if people wanted to do more, and a bunch of people said, yeah, we do. And they were like, ah, we don't really offer you more, so. Um, and then, actually, the same survey never really got read by anybody. Um, I, I hate to say it, but um, we don't often ask our supporters what they're interested in and why they care about our cause or our issue. Um, and it's not because we're assholes, it's because we're overwhelmed. Um, and because our orientation is more around policy and that kind of uh, that expert driven communications. So basically, for most nonprofits, um, it's like a fake a grassroots program. And for those of you who have studied nonprofits, you know, the head of uh, Eco Justice, you guys know them, they were Sierra Legal Defense Fund. So Canada's National Law Firm for the Environment told me a story about how when they started, it was literally like families in Alberta, they got together because something nasty was happening in their neighborhood, like a spill, a poison river, or something like that. And so a community got together and said, what should we do? And well, let's, and then, well, I'm a lawyer, okay, well, let's, well, you go to Ottawa and you try to fight this one. So they did. And then, okay, that's cool, let's try to, well, we need staff and, you know, we need to get paid. All that stuff's really natural, but basically, you know, 20 years later, and there's like, that system that I just described, where there's no support or engagement anymore. They're just donors. And I don't mean to pick on them, that's a story their, their ED told me about how he wanted to bring them back to more of that grassroots. So a lot of people like Eli, in, in, in theory, I have no idea whether this is true, um, run a program that's kind of like, a, you know, it's sort of, it's not necessarily directly connected to the fundamental workings of the organization. Um, and not, that's unfair to use you as an example of pointing picking out that way, especially if it's going on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So let's get back into the arc here, which is um, what are network orgs? Uh, how are they different? Um, why do traditional institutions struggle with online? Um, and uh, then we'll get into some stories. So, um, the reason why NGOs like that struggle with digital, and I've been in some rooms where people are literally saying, "A panel list." Like that's like that's what they're thinking. You know, we got our email list, and and, um, and you know, my thing is so important; it's got to get out there. I don't care what they think or whether they're even going to click on it. It's just got to get out. Online is often run within the silo. Um, it's really hard to keep up with publishing demands. Everyone's knocking on your door, and they need this report done or that new thing done, and it's it's a really typical or difficult environment to work in. Um, the often the department that does the if they have a department. Um, one of my clients is an amazing uh, civil rights organization in DC, and they have a they, they organize Latino voters in five states, and they run social service programs and like with through 300 affiliates. They're amazing, but their online team is like boop, over here. So there's all this stuff happening in the world, real stuff, and then the online people, and it's like they're on a different floor, and you know it's just it's just hard to kind of connect the dots. Um, you have a different boss, so you know it, it's it's hard to be separate. Um, Communications is under, well, like I told you, this is kind of nerdo, and um, I'm really, I'd be open to feedback at the end of this about, um, about this, but um, I guess that the ultimate thing is I'd say that the staff in nonprofits built their careers, you know, being experts, which means not really being comfortable asking for help, uh, or saying that they don't know the answer, um, being perfect, which is all about not making mistakes, never admitting a failure, um, you know, the climate movement in the U.S., like, total massive, absolute failure, and then yet, almost up until recently, almost no kind of public acknowledge or any, even kind of internal like why did this happen and let's really think it through and let's explore I mean some of it but but not as much as it needs to be um, they're professional so they're kind of boring and inaccessible policy wonk voice um, they're used to being the best and they're now seeing an erosion of influence even people at the city of Vancouver the city manager told her staff once that we just don't have the control we used to have we don't have we don't set the agenda anymore the agenda is set for us so we have to do a different kind of civic engagement um, and ultimately you can't control the web so because network orgs are built around a high engagement model, that's why they're going to be more effective in an engaged world, in a medium that's based around self-organized uh, networks that are um, no one is going to pass something on because you told me to. I'm going to pass it on because I think it's cool, or I trust you, 
or um, any number of reasons other than like you told me to, so I'm going to pass it on. And that's sort of the old model. So again, with network orgs, you know, I'd say a lot of them people, the power of people, people power lie at their, their core theory of change. I mean, like I said, in the bigger institutions, it's more policy is the theory of change. And then people maybe can kind of push a certain policy every now and then. A lot of network work, because I find, is, is different. That social culture, the comfortable co-creating solutions with, with people outside their walls, partners. You know, I tweeted something yesterday, a Beth Cantor quote that says, um, it's a great tweet, uh, focus on what you do best, network the rest. So even in a world, if you had all the capacity and all the money in the world, that would probably be a smart strategy. But if you don't have much capacity because you want to balance life or you're only doing this part time or this, your issue is really hard, um, then why don't you focus on what you do best and network the rest? Um, it's scary to do that. They have this transparent model um, and they have a simple, straightforward focus. And I add to that very, you'll see in some of these sites we look at, um, a real strong investment recently in more kind of messaging and user experience is what UX means. Um, which is like a clean, simple site where there's like there's not 50 things and 500 actions and 50 programs. It's like boom, we're here to do this thing, bang. You know, just like an Airbnb or a, you know some of these really popular online. So before I get into some stories, um, why this model is a good mix for our times, um, it really maps directly to web values, and I've, I've done a lot of thinking. Clearly, in my job, as requires me to do that. About what are the kind of web values or the kind of fundamental principles of success online and this thing, the conversational style, the meeting people where they're at, the encouraging self-organizing systems and the meaningful participation are, are kind of the main web values. Um, so we really match with that. Um, in a complex world, we need lots of different players. Uh, these organizations can stretch scarce resources a long way. Um, that's certainly been my experience with them. Uh, we get to engage all this talent locked up in our communities. One of my clients that does work around homelessness their, their basic premise for why their model like, totally rocks homelessness and, and ends up with like a 98% success rate in like, Times Square and like really hardcore places is because they unlock the resources in communities. They see homelessness as a, as a um, symptom of a broken community. Um, and if you, un if you tap the resources that are in that community, the volunteer efforts and the social services that aren't coordinating and, um, and people in the business world and, and other people that aren't necessarily engaged, you can actually find long-term um, uh, solutions to these problems. Um, organizations can really focus on opportunities and um, I hope we all know that innovation doesn't come from experts. The Economist actually proved that pretty resoundingly a couple of years ago in a big study. Uh, the, t the bottom two sources of innovation in corporations were senior executives and consultants. <laughs> Literally. And this is like, like products that actually did awesome over the long term. Um, and the top were frontline staff and partners. So. Um, so I'm not saying we should all be networks, I'm just saying that we actually need a lot more of them. Uh, and you, we've all heard the refrain, of like, there's too many nonprofits, and why are there 10 people doing homelessness on the Kentucky side? And, um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a right-wingness to that, kind of, where, where are all these people working? And, and then there's the actual reality, which is like, we should be connecting the dots more and not working so much in isolation and not worrying so much about our brands and, um, and just kind of getting the work done and worrying less about how we work or what the structure of our work is. Is that cool? Is that? That's, that's my story. Um, so let's look at some stories. Does anyone have any comments or questions before I do that? Yeah, a quick one. Um, I'm on the technology field, and we were just discussing with some friends last week how, like, the IBMs and the big corporations in technology, a lot of them recognize that they are too big and unwieldy to really come up with the most innovative things and that they're gonna go and set aside money to actually come into business schools or invest in like small startups, going, this is where the innovation's gonna come from. It's not gonna be a guy we hired 15 years ago who we've now promoted and spends all his time managing people or writing spreadsheets or whatever we're gonna do instead of the stuff we want to do originally. Um, yeah. Is there opportunities for that? Like the bigger nonprofits, like the Coleman Foundation say, there's this pocket of people in wherever who engaged like a huge percentage of their community around breast cancer, let's partner with them and they can say they're Coleman Foundation and we can, you know, can leverage what they're doing and see, try to make that work elsewhere? Or is everyone still too concerned about, we didn't think of that, so we're not gonna do it? Yeah, it's a big, big question. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly nonprofits don't tend to acquire or merge or 
or um, do the kind of innovation, kind of creative destruction things that happen a lot in the business world. Um, I community-driven innovation is sort of this new field, and they're trying to do it. I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to this, but the funding mechanism is what's really messed up. Because funders aren't really comfortable with that. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. Does anyone else have comments about that? It's really interesting. <laughs> I disagree this is a new concept. Or, you know, as someone who went through the 60s and places where green peace were found and these other um, now established organizations started in the same environment. So we continue uh, to see the established mainstream organizations driven by uh, old fashioned and, and out of date uh, structures of funding. And so they, they're responding to that. We tend to hire people that are really good at finding the funding according to how the silos go. And so I think that's part of the history that we need to connect with, is those people are still around and founded those organizations sometimes, and they're up. They got booted out a long time ago because, you know, the founder never gets to run the business. But that's the point, is that this is the cycle with new technology. So there are lessons to be learned. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, any other quick comments or challenges or for another moment or no one's degree? <laughs> yeah? Um, I know that often funders do dictate the, the structure in terms of, of the nonprofit's um, activity quite um, strictly in a way that it wouldn't happen in the business world. So um, it would, in terms of talking about like network of organizations, how do they deal with those kinds of Fortunately, yeah. I mean, there are some more enlightened funders. There, there, there was a network funders group that just met in the Bay Area a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago. Um, you know, more kind of maverick program officers. But yeah, a lot of them exist with them outside of the funding cycle. That with kind of major donor funding or um, uh, that social enterprise is, is an interesting model if you can figure out enterprising. Uh, side to the to the work that brings in revenue and kind of transfer over the business models are the hardest part. Um, and then there's some of them like Avaz that started with like three billionaires that started funding them, and they um, uh, they don't tell that story very often. But they also got a million person list from Move On. They got your bonds international list that that you weren't. They didn't give a shit about you because you weren't in America. So um, so they had this list sitting around, and then Avaz kind of got that as a seed. So so there are I mean you know hopefully stories like that will encourage more. More funders. There are some foundations that take risks. I thought your comments were really interesting about the lack of connection of activism and some of the established NGOs. Um, I want to pick on Suzuki Foundation, but I've been member of Suzuki Foundation for a long time. There doesn't seem to be any connection at all between the size of the organization, what it's asking people to do, or activating people. And, and that seems to be a very common story. Yeah, my. When I look at this, I wonder how much of this with the network nonprofit is I look at them, they really seem like they are in service to, to the membership. There is a much stronger connection. Um, and I wonder if can large organizations keep some of that by structuring themselves to be very explicitly as a member run, member driven organization? Because I look at these large nonprofits, yeah, they're the board and, and what the membership may be. Are not definite, are not connected. I don't know if there are large nonprofits who do have that kind of membership model. Well, and I think the difference with being member driven now, to speak to Judy's point, is that your members can talk to you every five minutes on Facebook. So it's a completely different universe in terms of how closely connected you can be to them than you ever could be before. So the kind of potential that that opens up to be to be really authentically member driven is, I think, quite new. Um, but then there's also like you know should should policy be crowdsourced? I mean, uh, do you want a crowdsourced position to you know like the the you know like, I mean there's a there's a there's a there's a role for expertise right and this isn't about like swinging all the way to the other end and just like total um, there's a well, yeah an uninformed public is not a good place to crowdsource anything including the government. <laughs> 
Yeah, and so I think what a lot of network nonprofits are doing is working with an engaged membership. I mean, a great example is, is Avaz sets their priorities with their members. And if, if you want to know, if you work in this field, you know, you're always like, look through rates and how do I get my open rate up and how do I get people to take this action? And, and, and um, I, when I worked with Avaz more intimately during the Copenhagen climate year, Joe and I last saw us each other in Copenhagen. Um, that was kind of a crazy time. Um, uh, they, um, before doing this really crazy thing that they'd never done before, which was asking people to do a distributed global day of action. It was called the Global Wake Up Call, where you would call, um, you'd meet in, in your city in an iconic building and call your leaders and say, this is a wake up call, you need to get a deal out of Copenhagen. And then you'd take pictures of that and upload it and we would share those pictures to the world. They'd never done anything like that before. So before doing it, you know, we're all making up all these ideas in our rooms, like, oh, people, let's do this and that'll influence these people. They asked, they asked their members. Amazing, technology enabled them to do that to do really fast, and they got 98% said, like, I'm in, I'm totally in for that, I totally want to do that, including thousands of people that put up their hands to help organize it. Um, so, so we just knew it was going to be successful, right? Rather than like, oh, you know, let's send this action out, oh, dang, only 4,000 people clicked on that one, I guess that's a bit of a dud. Um, you know, if you're actually member-driven, but, but it's, it's kind of radical, it's, it goes against that kind of policy side. I almost, least, I almost forgot that story. Yeah, that's that's true. It, it was yeah, and it was the lead up to your guys' amazing global yeah. day of action a couple of, a, month, a month later. So here's some quick stories from my world. Um, I find it better to tell stories of my own experience rather than kind of make stuff up that I think other people did. So um, one of the biggest uh, con one of the breaks I got in this field was maybe six years ago, um, getting involved with a little campaign called Nothing But Nets, um, which started off uh, as a um, just as an idea of a Sports Illustrated writer. So just really briefly, this is, you can see that. Um, so in 2006, my area was really overshadowed by other causes like make poverty history and the issue was really misunderstood and it seemed like it was kind of impossible. So, um, uh, and a lot of the images were really negative and, and um, it was kind of faceless. So this guy, Rick Riley, who if you're in sports, I guess you know who he is, he writes for Sports Illustrated, wrote a column, raised a million bucks, he went to the UN Foundation um, which is a separate organization, and they created a campaign. Um, so we did the campaign, and blah, blah, blah. If you want to go to the end, it's raised like $44 million from Larry and helped catalyze George Bush's billion dollar gift to it. And, I mean, it, it really helped kind of create a uh, catalyze into the movement. But the, re the network part of it is this campaign started in a real scum works. It wasn't part of their traditional, like, okay, we're policy people, let's make a campaign to get people to care about Larry. It was like, it kind of got brought to them by a, by a free agent, by a writer who has his own following. It wasn't tapped out by a million on, on nonprofit asks. And then they went and built these partnerships with Sports Illustrated, NBA Cares, and the United Methodist Church, which has 13 million members. It made it feel like their campaign. They were like, hey, you guys, this is our campaign. And they grew it to all these other partners. Um, and so they have really simple messaging, which we helped them with uh, to really frame the issue in a positive way, um, an easy way for people to get involved, really transparent ways to show what the impact of their involvement was. Um, you know, I think you gave to me a long time ago. That was, uh, you know, we did these little fundraisers. This was kind of innovative five years ago. It's not so much now, but people power teams at the core. Um, and then we did a lot of storytelling to show people, like, here's where your money's going. This is how many nets got delivered. Um, uh, videos, you know, a lot of, a lot of more than just your typical fundraising kind of emotional storytelling. Um, so, you know, everyone was Bill Gates doubled the money, and American Idol got on board, and we got a million dollar email. Some guy gave a million bucks through email. We raised eighteen million dollars in its first year. We won a, we won a Webby. Um, and then what happened is uh, the institution that founded it got kind of annoyed because they didn't get as much brand control as they wanted to. So they actually told me, we're never going to do anything like that again. Five years later, they've never done anything like that again. So um, uh, I, to me, that's a story of a, you know, this sort of network skunk works that started up and then the institution went, hey, what were you, hey? And then they kind of wanted it and they claimed it and it's still awesome. I mean, I don't mean to be too critical, but, but it had so much less energy, and the other campaigns they've done since then just don't have that same kind of people power, partnership vibe uh, to them, and, and they, they haven't been as successful. Um, so the most interesting network campaign I got involved with, and then I'm, I'm kind of done after this, so I'm going to just tell one quick story, uh, is, I've alluded to it a few times, um, is the Copenhagen climate change thing. So, I mean, it's not every day that someone walks into your office with a $12 million budget and no set business plan, and then about a year to go, about 10 months to go before, you know, what could be the next like kind of big global movement gathering place, which is what happened. Um, uh, so so the, the, the quick story is this. Um, oh, there's a funny picture of George Bush. Um, 
So you've all heard this before, you know, global emissions have to peak, you may not have heard this part, but the science says we have to peak by 2015 or there's a lot of tipping points that we're going to hit. So, you know, requiring the, the scale of change is like so immense. Um, society's going to have to work together in unprecedented ways and it also needs a global legal framework as well as individual action as well as business action and municipal action and all that. So uh, this group of 25 core that grew about 250 nonprofits by the end of the year brought together faith groups, labor, health, global south, human rights groups. Um, we grew extremely quickly, we responded to a lot of rapidly changing situations and we aligned the work of these extremely diverse partners, um, hyper independent partners. Uh, and we did it through a network campaign. Before they showed up to me, they already had this idea of doing an open source campaign. Um, where it wouldn't be like the Make Poverty History campaign where all the groups kind of subsumed their brand into this other brand um, and had a rock star on top of it, Bono, but where we're actually a flotilla where everybody's independent, you're allowed to do your own thing, but we're going to align ourselves on key messages around key moments. Um, we're going to say similar things at similar times. Um, and that was the only it. It was kind of like the visa story, like, you know, you can do whatever you want, except you have to do these three things. And that's like how visa has grown such a big business if you ever studied that. Um, so our, our call to action was kind of the big thing we delivered. We, we, we worked on this language, really high level, fair, ambitious, and binding climate agreement. And then all of a sudden the policy people were just furious, like, what about clean coal? And the unions were like, what about jobs? And, everyone, and if we would have got into all that detailed policy, the coalition would have just fractured and we would have had no kind of big umbrella. So we had to keep it really high level. But it also ended up being really, you know, the British uh, PM used it and the economists used it. And it still sticks if you read stuff today. They still call it, they need a, they don't use exactly fair, ambitious, and binding, but they definitely use ambitious and binding. So, so we frame that as the NGO movement. That's, that's we're, we're kind of stoked about that. Um, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes policy coordinations, which I won't get into, but was really powerful. We had to build a website that um, didn't piss off the big brands that didn't want us competing with their turf or building a big list, but that also actually showed the power of the movement together. It was not easy to figure out what kind of web strategy to make that, to make happen. And we got a lot of help. Um, and it would not be complex, it had to be very simple. So uh, we had this engagement model, if you haven't seen engagement pyramids before, groundwire.org has a really great resource on them, they're a great firm down in Seattle. Um, and we had the only engagement pyramid for the campaign, and, and uh, there were actual things for people to do at the, are you guys familiar with this? Like, you know, people hear about you as the aware and they care is like they join your list, and the join is that they take an action or they, um, they do something more substantial. Act means they're actually out kind of building your campaign in the world and lead, lead is mostly what Joe's group works with as leaders who actually are organizing events. And most NGOs don't know how to work with leaders, external leaders. All the online stuff we did, the biggest impact was in the real world. Things really came together around that. Avada story I told you we had um, 2,800 events, I think, in 160 countries organized in three weeks um, simultaneously. And then 350's Global Day of Action was, what was it, Joe, was it 5,000 events in every country, except for two? Perfect. Organized by tiny groups of people. How the heck do you do that? You're a network nonprofit. Um, um, so all these events happen all over the world. All kinds of independents were starting to show up and use the brand and, and famous people and videos were popping up. It was really awesome. But basically we were going into Copenhagen and people were still doing that thing I told you about of like my expert and my issue and my TV channel and my Twitter feed. And, and so we really had to come up with a big plan for how we would change that. We kind of all came together as a movement in Copenhagen. Those are the three of the smartest activists in the world. Um, Joe's old boss, Jamie, on the side. Ricken, who's the Canadian founder of Oz and Ben Margolis, who is my 30-year-old uh, campaigns director of Tech, which is a big reason why Tech 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 rocked, because it was run by someone who was 29 at the time. Um, not that it's just an age thing, but it's just a culture thing, really, more than that. Um, so, what did we accomplish? We aggregated 17 million people from almost every country on the in the world through all the partners and all the activity, and a lot of it was real world, a bunch of it was online. Um, uh, it was like pulling teeth, but we did it. Um, we reframed the issue as one that was happening now and that had a human impact. It wasn't just an environmental impact. One of my highlights was Naomi Klein in our media center that we ran saying, uh, this is the day that the social justice movement and the environmental movement come together. And that was like, mm. um, And that was a big part about our communication strategy. And finally, because we weren't allowed to do traditional PR, we went big online and did all kinds of work connecting bloggers and global media. We ran this awesome media hub. It was kind of like this, but a lot bigger with like 500 people in it for two weeks. It was pretty incredible and got a lot of messages aligned and, and ideas spread and, and resources shared. And then on the last day to stop any kind of bad message framing from happening is we um, 
got, if you can believe it, we got uh, 15 or 18 of the biggest nonprofits going to uh, take over their homepage with one message um, uh, during, for about two or three days, most of them did it for, um, to make sure that we really were speaking with one voice and reframed the issue as, as not that we were happy with it, but that we, we still need more to do. Um, okay, those are my tick tick stories. I guess the, 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 the point of the tick 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 story is it was a network organization on a grand scale. I've never seen anything like it, and I don't know if I'll ever see anything like it again. Um, it, it wasn't universally like, that was the best thing we've ever done. I mean, there was a lot of critiques of us and, and of how we did it, but we, we did, we had all those attributes. We were this tiny global site. I, I stayed on, by the way, to run the digital campaign, so I stopped being a consultant for like six months and kind of did Eli's job for a while. Um, and uh, we were this tiny team working all these time zones, Skyping all the time. There was super rapid response, not a lot of hierarchy. Um, constant check-ins, constantly pivoting on new things, um, and uh, and we got a lot done in a, in a very short amount of time um, through a network model, which is kind of that's what kind of solidified my own uh, belief in this as a model. So um, I can tell you more stories, like from the Web of Change that Eli mentioned, which is definitely a network nonprofit. It's it's got no structure. Um, it's been around for 12 years. It's it's trained almost a thousand people. It's it's many many online campaigners, like kind of one of the primary touch points for the year. It's got really strong role in people's lives, and we do it on like very little resources with distributed volunteers, um, you know, no funders, so it's, it's kind of that example. Um, I have lots of other clients. One thing that's really cool is um, Avaz shares their theory of change um, on their new website that a local firm, Biro Creative, did. Um, and they are very upfront. They say, this is how we work. We uh, are very nimble, and our Prioritize, come from our, our priorities come from our members, very true. They're always polling and they actually do listen. Um, God, I brought up servant leadership to a client the other day and they just got furious about the word serve. Like, we don't need serve! <laughs> that was like to their internal staff, who are like their customers. Freaked out about that word. Well, guess what? It's a popular term in the business world um, that you're, you're not just there for yourself. Um, uh, they focus on tipping point moments where their scale can kind of, so they, they know that they're not the ones doing the hard policy work that's long term. Um, their member-driven model, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, and so, anyways, I, that's pretty cool. I think that they're, you know, they're basically the most successful NGO on the planet right now in a lot of ways. They're really, they've got so much momentum. They're tipping things all over the place, um, and they're a network organization. So let's hear from um, Joe, who is also sharing billing with me tonight. Who just decided to come to Vancouver about two days ago. Great. Uh, tell us about Keystone. Gosh, it's really good to be back. It's been, it's been like two and a half years. I see that day. Just close my eyes <laughs> um, so, so I think I think some kudos are in order. You know that this week the Net Tuesday Vancouver community surpassed one thousand members. Oh, sure. Wow. Sure. Yeah. Um, the crazy thing is. I get all the credit for this now, which is a huge lie because all the work. No, 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 wait. I did not start. I did not found this community. This community pretty much found itself. Uh, and, and Eli has been sharpening it uh, after I just kind of managed kind of overnight um, a while ago. So huge kudos to Eli and the volunteer network that are still so lonely most of that. So I, I think we've also made a lot of progress over the last two, two and a half years or so. Um, we've kind of moved from tools and technology to issues and causes. A lot of online organizers started out uh, building Facebook apps and, and Twitter widgets and what have you. And we don't really do that as much anymore. We talk about things that are happening in the streets, things that are affecting communities, uh, the moral issues of our times. And an even deeper sea change happened over the last two and a half years or so. We moved from talking about uh, issues and causes to talking about uh, really deep injustices and unjust systems that connect us all, keep us all kind of hanging in the balance. And over the last few months, you know, Occupy has been a really big part of that, showing that uh, practical hypocrisy, uh, uh, money politics, um, and to a degree, the climate crisis are these just huge issues of our time that if progressives don't sort of come together and deal with it in a networked way, um, uh, well, we're going to keep losing, and, and it's true, we are losing. Every major uh, progressive fight these days is losing. Um, and we can talk about that, but you probably know it. Um, that's why you're here, we're going to start winning. Um, um, so I want to talk a little bit about why 
why, who I am. Um, I've stepped back from the 350 team, but I'm psyched as ever about it. Uh, I just couldn't deal with that, uh, that real time stuff for, for two years. That burns your eye. Um, you gotta be really responsive. Um, but I'm still really psyched, and that's kind of why I'm here. I've been traveling the country a little bit, trying to talk to the people in the places that have really moved me over the last couple of years at, and reconnect. And, um, and so the reason that I left uh, Vancouver, I went from Vancouver to move, a little stop over in Seattle, mostly moved to Vermont. And uh, I, I was dating an incredibly lovely woman at the time while I lived here. Um, and when that sadly didn't work out, I moved to Vermont with, with a bit of a broken heart. Um, and I'm a slow healer uh, when it comes to these things. Um, so while I'm still healing, we're going to skip ahead two years, almost the present. I'm in Vermont, kind of calling me home. And, you know, I, I'm still broken inside, which is kind of sudden. Um, but our state starts to break. Our state gets hit by one of the biggest uh, uh, storms it's ever seen uh, this past summer. Uh, the way that I would personally handle our state is just crushed by uh, uh, Hurricane Irene, because there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Intimidating kind of excitement around Long Island evacuated. DC was, you know, getting ready to be uh, flooded, uh, and it, it goes up the northeast coast, and it doesn't really do that much damage until it turns into just a tropical storm and floods Vermont, a highly vulnerable state, kind of the new Tuvalu or the Maldives of the climate. Um, and it hurt. It really hurt to hear. I'm first up in Burlington, in southern Vermont. Towns were just washed away. Uh, my favorite bookstore. Uh, from when I was little, when I used to visit Vermont in the summer, just, 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 just the, 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 the little creek that's right, right by it turned into a raging river and, and, and flooded the, that little first floor bookshop. And it's not just clear water with dolphins and things, you know, it's muddy water with silt that destroys everything it touches. And I didn't realize that when us Burlingtonians were mostly unscathed, except for some of our farmland and Lake Champlain property, um, that when we go into the flood zone to do repair and to do recovery, the recovery means destruction. You've got to go into the, these mobile park homes. You've got to destroy someone's house because it's got to be taken down. You've got to take out their washer, their dryer, and figure out a way to maybe get into a dumpster if you have a big enough crew. You've got to take the, those parents' baby clothes and, and that are just, just really spoiled at the point that they're taken out uh, and put them into garbage bags to be hauled out. Um, if you're lucky, the Ben and Jerry's truck is coming with fresh ice cream. You're doing this really daunting work, um, and you've got to take people's uh, family photographs that are shattered if they fell or coated with mud if they didn't, and, and you've got to toss them out too. So our state was being really hurt, and some of us uh, saw it coming. Our spring flood really bad too. This was late summer, and, uh, and we were asking why. Why is Vermont really being hammered? Why are we suddenly, is our weather either like Costa Rica's or like the Pacific Northwest, kind of always raining and wet? You know, no one has uh, that much of winter this season, but we didn't have that much of summer uh, in the sense that it was more hot than it was usual and more rain. Um, and we don't have much of winter now either. Um, and so, so we started looking around, and a bunch of climate activists, you know, it's not too hard for us to figure out what's going on. There's a lot of fossil fuel corporations that are burning. It's tough. It has a lot of carbon, coal, oil, and gas. And, uh, and that's, that's the, 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 the glut and majority of what's altering our atmosphere and, uh, and what's causing this kind of parallelized extreme weather. So we looked around. We looked a little bit north. And I was like, you know, I love Canada. They're up there. And they've got these tar sands, which are kind of sucky. Uh, uh, they've got the second largest uh, pool of carbon on the planet. And, uh, and that's not really good. It's second only to Saudi Arabia's oil fields. And they're being burnt up, and, and the rainforest being destroyed, and the oil's being burned, and Vermont gets flooded. Uh, and right around that time, uh, uh, the American government wanted to lay down, no, TransCanada wanted to lay down a pipe across from the uh, Burn Tar Sands all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Keystone XL. This is equivalent to the Northern Gateway fight that you have up here, right? Um, um, and, uh, and so, um, this kind of brings me much closer to the present, and so why we're here to talk, is we need to fight back. We need to fight this pipeline, not just because 
it would be uh, devastating to the aquifers that are in our heartland, the indigenous communities that are in our heartland, because it would accelerate the, the, the tar sands. It would give a green, big green thumbs up to, uh, to burning up all that stuff. Um, and um, we had to stop. And Vermont was a huge part of this coalition that formed. And I want to talk a little bit about it. Um, and the coalition is called Tar Sands Action in the US. And it managed to mobilize every major green group in the US, just like Jason was talking about, getting all these groups on the same page and forming a brand list website, tarsandsaction.org, forming brand <coughs> list Facebook and social media. I remember when Duncan, the social media coordinator for, for Tar Sands Action, wrote me and I was at 350. He was like, we're going to start this Facebook page. I was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. We'll all do it through 350. And he didn't really respond. He just did anyway. <laughs> uh, and it was such a good idea. It was it's now become this just hub, this real time hub for, for the environmental justice movement across the states and the world follows along. And um, you, you know, you may have heard, but we, well, we did stop this pipe. We, we uh, gave a blow uh, to the biggest, dumbest project of big oil's uh, uh, wish list in history. And and we did it through uh, a network campaign. But uh, that's kind of big, and I know you want some of the, 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 the juicy details. Um, so um, the way it really began uh, was through all the stuff you would kind of imagine, especially if you're in kind of the network age. You start bringing together the broad coalition. You call for partners. You call messengers. You say, we've got to do this thing. We're going to lose if we don't. We make the case. You get a few groups on board. You don't get them all. You get moving. Kind of form the Ocean's Eleven of the key to saving the world. You know, you bring the best media person from Rainforest Action Network, the best uh, civil disobedience campaigner from Greenpeace. You bring the, you know, someone from Move On. You bring the 350 Magic Man, Jamie Hen, and and you tumble it all together. You got this new crew, and uh, and we did that and uh, shared fundraising so that we we could fund this movement. It's not we're not siloed up. Um, Shared messaging um, and uh, all that kind of stuff. One stop shop for the press. We were fortunate to be able to, to do mainstream press as well as new media as this coalition. Um, all that kind of stuff you might expect from a network organization, um, um, which I would agree with Judy, is less an evolution of where we're at and more a discovery or rediscovery of how social movements worked in the past. This is how we won uh, on civil rights. Uh, this is how we won when it came to women's rights, the suffragettes. This is how we beat apartheid in South Africa. Um, you, you, you connect the groups together, and more importantly, you connect the people power and the basis of, of active activists together. Uh, and you come uh, with a unified voice. You don't remember the green piece of the civil rights movements. Right? You don't uh, remember the David Suzuki Foundation of the suffragettes. You remember people in the streets. Right? You remember everyday people being extraordinary heroes and taking sacrifice and showing courage. And those are the kinds of things I want to talk about to build on Jason's talk. I want to talk about three things that, that really made Tarsus action more than just a coalition, but made it a kind of a, a winnable campaign. I want to talk about courage, I want to talk about love, I want to talk about truth. And kind of maybe in that word. Um, courage. We didn't just build a website for the sake of building a website. We didn't just build a list for the sake of building a website. We didn't just have Facebook because it's nice to gather likes or a Twitter account because counting retweets is kind of fun and a little addictive. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, we actually wanted to listen to the boldest voices in the room. This is a rare thing for coalitions. We wanted to listen to the bravest voices in the room, the indigenous people in the room, the people that were willing to put their bodies on the line. Uh, we wanted to uh, engage people not as donors, uh, not as petition signers. I don't think either one who started out this campaign with, but as heroes, as leaders as fully engaged human beings, fully alive, uh, and fully uh, empowered. So the first action was an impossible one. It was at the end of summer, where we invited uh, everyone across the US, and even a couple Canadians came out, uh, to do something ridiculous, to do something impossible, uh, to risk arrest, to sit down in front of the White House in this postcard perfect area, where if you sit down, uh, for more than a few minutes, uh, the Secret Service or whatever Navy SEALs, uh, they have like 50 police organizations in DC, it's kind of complicated. Um, they're not very good. 
they, they, they arrest you and call you up. It happens zip times. Um, and so Bill McKibben, Dave Suzuki, my only client, these heroes of our time, put out an open invitation powered by this new Ocean's Eleven. That was pretty much like this. The stakes are really high. The planet's in crisis. We need to act at the scale of that crisis. We need to speak the truth. The tar sands are the second greatest pool of carbon on the planet. We've got to extinguish it, and the least we do is stop this pipeline that would accelerate. And we've got to do it with courage, and we've got to do it with resolve, and we've got to do it with integrity. And everything that we've done so far is failing. The least we could do is try some direct action. Uh, kind of unprecedented since the 60s. Um, and uh, the sensation went out and said, we're not just going to do a day of action. We've done these days of action. We two weeks, every week, every day, we're going to send a wave of people from across the country, all 50 states, to sit down in front of the White House. And uh, no one knew if this would be a success. Uh, but all these people uh, started signing up. Hundreds of people started signing up, uh, including a bunch from Vermont. And uh, we were about to be flooded around this time. This is kind of kind of flashback in here. And so put out the call. And uh, day one, Bill Kip and Gus Speck, I mean, these great leaders, <coughs> to sit down in front of the White House, about, I don't know, 60, 50, 40 of them, um, a, good, a good crew. Uh, and uh, the police, are, they don't get it. They don't get it. we're going to do this the next day, too, um, with a different group of people. So they arrest them, and they literally send them to county jail, uh, to DC block, or whatever it's called. And they hold them overnight. And they hold them overnight. I think they hold them overnight again. Because they figure, well, if we hold them in jail, they can't go back the next day. Uh, little did they know. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and this is wonderful. I mean, when, when power screws with you, they don't get it. Uh, the, the powerless become a lot more powerful. Um, so Bill only gets one call from jail. And he gets to talk to his wife. And he tells his wife, you know, we know a lot of people have a lot of uh, uh, sympathy for us right now. But we don't want your sympathy. But we want your comfort. Yeah, that's really Twitter. You know? <laughs> I got a lot of likes on Facebook. Uh, and it worked. Drove after drove, day after day, the police were overwhelmed, uh, although they were quite civil. Uh, the jails were overwhelmed. Jails were overwhelmed. Uh, well, no, they weren't, because they, because they actually started letting people out within hours. Uh, and it was great fun to kind of be arrested, have that experience, and then be calling up your mom a little while later. Um, uh, so Vermont sends a bus down, and the storm's hitting. It was, uh, I didn't quite make it clear that the storm's hitting as we're going down. And, uh, and, and, and so literally, we're, we're, we're pretty much climate refugees, you know. As we're picking up people in Brattleboro, the bus stops, pick up some more Vermonters. Um, um, we, we get down, we, we're upstate New York, and, uh, and uh, we start, we get Wi-Fi in the back of the bus. You have to hack your iPhone, you get Wi-Fi. And, uh, we see that, uh, that, that, that that parking lot where we just picked up people is just a boom flood underwater. It's really scary stuff. Um, and the bus drive and, 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 and the roads are being closed off and it's going to get a lot harder to get to the city to this thing. And uh, the bus driver starts going on this highway and the sign says, now this highway can only be used for emergencies only. It says, and he just screams to the whole bus and I don't even think he can use the mic. Is this an emergency? We're all like, yeah! <laughs> we gotta get down there. We gotta stop this. Thing. Um, we, we were really unprepared. We were kind of ready to connect these dots and um, get down to DC. And um, we do. We do it. We we sit. Uh, we sit down. There's these kids that sit with us for the photo op before everyone kind of has to go. Uh, and they have a sign that says, you know, sun and wind, rock, petroleum, not. And kids get it. Uh, tourists coming up with their segways, uh, the little daughter asks the mother, um, what are they doing over there? And uh, she says something like, uh, uh, honey, they're, they're practicing democracy. <laughs> and it was tough. It was really tough to sit there and watch our best friends get hauled off by these big Secret Service-like guys who were nice and some were even flirting with our gals. Um, <laughs> Um, but it was really tough. It was um, it was scary, and uh, um, you ended up kind of saying, uh, singing to each other as as you could get uh, taken away and clapping and sharing your neighbors on, your friends on, 
and um, and you would turn around because they'd say turn around, you're under arrest, and you know, they didn't have to carry us away. And then you would say I love you to everyone who's left. You took the women first, so I only got to see that to my brothers from Vermont. Um, and so that I think is is how we can make a lot more of our coalitions work. Um, by letting people truly, truly lead at the scale of the problems that we have. That's going to be different in different cases. But so far, we're still a little bit around collectivism. I mean, groups uh, likely now, no community, are really crashing that barrier with a lot more real engagement. But even of us, it's wonderful as they are, their main tool is still the online petition. Um, um, and I want to talk a little about, about love, because a lot of us aren't going to build these coalitions. A lot of us aren't even working at organizations. A lot of us are these free agents. And I want to talk about the free agent who, who really lifted up the climate movement. I'm sure I'm way over time here. Um, but his name was Tim De Christopher in the US. Has anyone heard of uh, him? I can kind of see hands at this point. Mm -hmm. All right, a little bit, a little bit. So Tim De Christopher is the Salt Lake City, Utah activist, regular guy, about my age. And um, he goes to this, and that, this is like, the heartland is the sacrifice zone for fracking uh, and for oil, oil uh, drilling and such. And so there's this auction, this, this national auction that's happening in Salt Lake city for parcels uh, uh, in, in, in Utah's pristine uh, mountainsides and things. And, and these oil and gas energies really want to drill. And so there's this huge rally outside uh, this, this uh, auction in, in Salt Lake City. And um, Tim just, you know, he's been a part of this community. He knows the people that are around. He knows that rally, as powerful it is, as it is, as strong as it is, is not going to be enough to stop this auction. So he walks inside and he doesn't know what he's going to do, but he knows he has to stop this auction. Because that's what's at stake. We can't just uh, uh, you know, lose um, with great splendor and with great um, notes of outrage. We've got to actually turn the tide. Um, and he um, eventually gets a, someone gives him a bidding pattern. He starts bidding, the number 70 is on it. And uh, he just wants, he just sees these wonderful lands that he spent so many years on just going for dollars, dollars on the acre. And so he just lifts, lifts up the path and ends up uh, raising the prices for various parcels. Um, and, and this is a mild crime at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he turns around and he sees uh, a church member that he knew from his Unitarian church, uh, this, this, this older woman in the back. And she, she turns around and she sees her crying. She knows this land is being sold off to the worst kind and she's crying, and she just looks at him, and he just kind of nod. And he doesn't put his paddle down. He ends up buying $1.8 million worth of parcels. And that's a big crime. Because he doesn't have no money. He's like most of us, you know, 99% right now. Um, and uh, so um, um, he started this group afterwards called Peaceful Uprising as he was being put on trial. Uh, over two years, that took them a long time to put him on trial. Um, and he was able to really start this courageous uh, group that was uh, committed to nonviolent direct action, to courage and bravery. Uh, and and he, just, he just inspired a lot of people with this creative, peaceful action. And um, this past uh, July, I think it was, uh, he was sentenced to two years in prison. Uh, and I just want to read to you a few words that he said at the Salt Lake City Courthouse uh, before uh, they hauled him away. Um, and I just got to visit that courthouse a week or so ago, and there's just this real sense about it that justice has not been served. Um, um, this is not going away, he says. At this point, in unimaginable threats on the horizon, this is what hope looks like. In these times of a morally bankrupt government that has sold out its principles, this is what patriotism looks like. With countless lives on the line, this is what love looks like, and it will only grow. I like to think of his story as one of love, and an inspirational story that we can bring to our movements, which are very much about analytics, as, 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 uh, when they really need to be about love. Um, um, and I forgot to mention, now on the courage track of things, in case you're being, getting a little confused here, um, um, not every green group came on board uh, on day one of that action, the two of some of the in front of the White House. And by the way, that was July, right? So that was a few months before this. So that courage by, you no, know, that love from a free agent inspired the courage for a nation. 
they created the open. And I mean, um, we can all do these things. I mean, there's no prescriptive handbook. Sorry. Uh, but we all have the, 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 the power to create these openings for these coalitions to form and to succeed. Um, and when that, when that coalition was formed, when Tarzan Action was formed, after uh, 275 arrests happened after day five, that's when every single Korean organization came on board. Not on day one, but after there were bodies in the streets. And so the head of Greenpeace, the head of NRDC, the head of Union of Concerned Scientists, the head of Sierra Club, they wrote a letter that said this, we want to let you know there's not an inch of daylight between our policy position on the Keystone Pipeline and those of the very civil protesters being arrested daily outside the White House. It's kind of an unprecedented thing. I mean, even like the EDF wrote this. They're the kind of people that water down Copenhagen. Um, good people, but not the kind of people that you're going to get on day one. And so when we build coalitions built on love and courage, uh, don't expect to figure it out just through meetings. You eventually got to make the bold call. And the groups will come on as you go. Um, after we wrapped, uh, it was really cool, uh, before we won, but after we wrapped that, those two weeks, uh, and it's a tentative win yet, the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Tutu and many other noble laureates came out uh, in favor of the, of the activists that were in front of the White House and called us break, among other really good things. Um, courage, love, and the third thing, truth. Um, um, we were willing to speak the truth about the climate crisis. Uh, and we, you know, we had, it wasn't a coincidence that we climate scientists for NASA went to the fence. James Hansen risked his job uh, because he figured out that if the tar sands are fully accelerated, if their expectation is fully accelerated, that means game over, and I quote, for the climate. And we said that over and over and over again. And I know there's some folks here that are involved with social justice and environmental justice, these fights uh, uh, and economic justice that are all intertwined. Um, that's the Northern Gateway Pipeline heats up here. I'm sorry if you're just here for Twitter tips. Um, 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 we've got a chance to speak that truth again. We've got a chance to speak the truth that even if that pipeline stays perfectly sealed from Alberta uh, to, to, to Northern uh, uh, British Columbia, that it's still going to spill carbon in the atmosphere when we accelerate the, the burning of the tar sands. And that means that if you lay that pipe to, to move oil, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be moving storms over Vermont. You're going to be moving uh, wildfires over Texas. You're going to be moving drought over Africa. You're going to be moving rising tides over the Maldives. That's truth we can speak. Uh, right now, uh, we have the strongest megaphones, online organizers, Twitter evangelists, uh, the kind of consultants that are in this room, not profiteers. We have the strongest megaphones, yet we are the quietest on this issue. Who are the loudest? Thankfully, it's the indigenous groups. Um, uh, just this past weekend, um, up north in uh, Prince Rupert, what did it say? Rupert. Rupert. Uh, a town with just about 1,300 people at Port C, uh, the indigenous folks held a rally. Uh, with a, oh, nearly a thousand bodies leading against this pipeline, speaking the truth, saying it's their family and their generation and their, you know, the, 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 the generations of their children that are on the line. One even said they would die to stop this pipeline. These are marginalized voices without megaphones. And they're asking for our help. And we have the megaphones. So, sorry that's not Facebook friendly per se, but uh, or, or, uh, a great tip for how to scale. Uh, your Facebook fan base, but uh, you know, I'm, my new home is in Vermont, so I gotta speak up for this stuff. Uh, this is, you know, you have a great chance to turn this time back on this one, and the fight's uh, just really beginning. I hear there's a burgeoning alliance happening in Vancouver, similar to what we saw stateside. Uh, I don't know if there's a rep here from that, um, but uh, at the very least, we'll need the free agents to give them the openings. Uh, to close, um, there's a lot of stuff on Sunday, so maybe there'll be time for q and I'm way over time. But I've been traveling, and one place I got to go that was wonderful was New Orleans. And um, wonderful because the homeless people have trumpets. How great the music just emanates from the city. Um, and it's a city that is just known for its bad luck. It's got all this musical resolve. Um, and go to, we go to this big brass band show in the French Quarter, or some quarter of New Orleans. And I don't dance, I'm kind of this geeky nerd. Uh, 
Um, and I just felt alive and like dancing. It's like this, all these brass instruments, there's no strings, no piano, just brass, like trumpets and saxophone, and some drum thing that's made out of brass. And, um, and I'm just, I'm moving, I'm moving. And the whole crowd is on fire. Like everyone's just letting their inhibitions go away. And, um, and it's just beautiful. And uh, after the song wraps, and people are just still in that afterglow moment, uh, the lead, uh, uh, musician, although it was pretty network, so it was unclear who the leader was, um, takes the microphone. And as a way to explain the way that he lit this crowd on fire, well, he just said, <coughs> but, well, he just said, uh, well, of course, because we didn't come here to bullshit at you. <laughs> I, I, that's how I feel when we really beat back this Keystone XL with the courage, you know, with the, with the love. And with the truth, we can say at the end, uh, when, because Obama sent it back for review and then the State Department nixed it, right? Uh, we were able to say, well, we didn't come here to bullshit at you. And I think you can use all these tactics in your work, and, and, and we're really just getting started this next evolution. So, thank you.
Um, and I really want to speak to, to Joe's point that building a big list is really just it's A in A to Z <laughs> for the Canadian syndrome. Um, so we had this big list, 500,000 people, and yeah, it really mattered. Like that kind of collectivism. I don't, I don't think we should let that be overshadowed because it was the 500,000 people who signed our petition that meant that all of a sudden big media was paying attention to us. George Stropolopoulos was talking about it on his show, and all of a sudden Stephen Harper is saying that the decision is going to have to be reviewed. And Tony Clement, who's the industry minister, is tweeting saying that CRTC has to go back to the drawing board. And from a government that's really proven that they really don't care what citizens think for the most part, this was really unprecedented. But it also allowed for the flourishing of all these other different kinds of activities that were not just confined to the sort of collectivism side. So we had, we formed these things called digital action teams where 5,000 people said that they were interested in doing something more than just clicking on a petition. And all of a sudden they were organizing rallies. Or we had a tech reporters calling us and saying, can you tell your supporters to stop calling me and complaining about my coverage of this issue? And I'm trying. So we had these people like calling up papers and being really angry. And then the thing that was also pretty incredible was um, the CRTC did have this review. And we, the CRTC sets up these like open processes for consultation. And there are these sort of like web forms that are really tough to use, nobody ever really does them. And so for a long time now, we've been like making a way for that to be easier for our own website. And in the past, we've had more than 10,000 people submit comments to a proceeding, which is like crazy. Like the CRTC is this really distant regulator, very controlled by industry. Nobody really cares about it. Nobody really understands what it is. And yet, we were able in the past to get like 10,000 people to submit a comment. So this UBB hearing rolls around with our half a million person list. And all of a sudden, there's 100,000 comments that get submitted to the CRTC proceeding. And we actually had something set up where they would get facts every time. <laughs> Which we had to stop doing. <laughs> And I want to I read this quote to you, but I forgot on my phone. Um, so we had this, this guy, Mark Coatsworth, and we, had these, we, we always have these leaders, like Joe talks about, that are like, I want to go all the way with you. Like, I don't want to just click the petition. I don't even want to just like, do graphic design or call a reporter or submit a comment. I want to come there and be there in front of the CRTC and tell them like, I'm watching and I care. And I'm going to care what you guys do. So he goes to the CRTC with us, and he talks about, like, sitting across from Mel and their army of lawyers and thinking like, man, you know, I'm just a small business owner. I just like had a 14 hour day writing my submission in a hallucinatory state. Like the power inter the power imbalance between us is huge. But he sees what happens during that hearing, which is that eventually the regulators actually start saying like, they don't really think that Bell is telling them the truth. And this is like new information to them, not new information to us. But it's the fact that people are actually willing to like go there, pay for themselves to get to get you know, that allows that to happen. So Mark kind of comes away from this hearing and says like, this whole thing was a lesson in democracy. Um, and it's hard to think of something like the CRTC as a site where democracy can happen, but it definitely is. And the more those little sites are places where democracy doesn't happen and isn't happening, the more undemocratic our society becomes. And that's a big deal. So anyway, the CRTC kind of goes after Bell and Mark has this great experience, talks about this kind of like renewed excitement about democracy, realizing that citizens can play a role. Um, and then eventually the decision comes out and the framework that's set is what we, what we wanted, what we would have wanted, and it's good. Um, and you know, that's a, a small change to the kind of internet market that we think will have a very meaningful impact and produce a tool that's so crucial to all of our work. But it was a huge change in terms of the regulatory environment and the sense that people can actually get involved in that and make a difference. And that actually there is some kind of potential for democratizing those sites and then our society as a whole. Uh, so, and we did all of this, as I said, with like two and a half and then three and a half staff. Um, and, and had this like big, big win. Um, and then have subsequently gone on to have these other wins. So we do sometimes win. Uh, and I want to just quickly, the last point I'm going to make is to talk about talk about what we're doing now, which is 
this campaign called Reimagine CBC. And uh, this is because you know we're, we're talking a lot about communication systems and communication systems are broken. And we think that the CDC is kind of a crucial piece of the non-brokenness, where there actually is this, this relatively well-funded body in Canada that has a mandate to serve us. So we need to make sure that it stays that way. So we're doing this campaign. And the really interesting thing about this campaign is that we're doing it in, in partnership with Lead Now, which is one of the organizations, organizations that Jason mentioned, another network not-for-profit. And I have to say, like, Seeing the way that we approach collaboration naturally is so inspiring. I don't think we've ever asked like where our brands are going to be in this campaign, or where our logos are going to appear, or who's going to get profiled for what. Like it's just not even a question. And we we're willing to share all of our internal documents with each other. We're looking at this as a real learning experience because we've got this kind of like massive list that we're trying to figure out some of that ladder of engagement stuff of how do we get them to take more of those kinds of actions like Mark Coatsworth did when he went to the CRTC. And they've got this like really engaged community, but it's not that big yet. So there's lots of learning to be done, and we approach it in that spirit. So I guess just, just to kind of wrap up, like when you approach things in that network-minded way, where you're listening to what people want, that means that you have the potential for these kinds of collaborations that are entirely new, and that have this kind of transformative impact on your organization, but also hopefully the ripple effect out to our community where they see that this is really isn't about what we need to us at all. It is about the change that we're all going to make together. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, I don't want to do what I was going to do anymore, but I want to see that. Yeah, so thanks for letting us talk about this stuff.